Well, there's no more Monday Night Football, but I have three words for you. Wizards at Spurs. You're welcome. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Welcome to this lovely show that we like to call Run It Back on a happy Monday morning. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel today, but then I want one thing that you guys did from the weekend that was fun. We'll start with Stadium Insider, Sham Sharania. Go. Seriously, Sham. Uh, worked on my inside pass on The Athletic. Okay, boring. Uh, Chandler. Steady plug in. Uh, not surprising at all. Lost every single bet on the NFL games yesterday. Oh, not surprising at all. And Eddie G. Chandler, she said fun. Uh, I recorded a new episode, et cetera, as a KD. We talked about okay. Chandler Parsons. Check it YouTube out. YouTube plug-in <laughs> fools, I swear to God. That, none of that's fun. That's all work. You guys need to look up what the definition I, of fun is. But we did watch basketball. We watched crap tons of basketball. And there was a lot. Saturday was a crazy day to begin with as well. But this one, Pelicans Bucks. How about Giannis? His second 50-point game of the season. This one in a win over New Orleans. Uh, Chandler, I'll start with you. How? Imp- By the way, before we get started, he is fifth now for MVP favorite on the FanDuel Sportsbook. But how impressed are you by his actions? Yeah, I'm super impressed. Just the way he's kind of kept this team right there in the thick of things in the Eastern Conference without, you know, their second best player in Chris Middleton, who now is back, but he's on a serious minute restriction, uh, trying to get his legs back. Bobby Portis being out is a huge hit to them, but I'm super impressed. The way he just kind of goes about, he dominates games. I will say his way of venting is is doing the whole, oh, I'm boring, I'm the Tim Duncan thing. <laughs> you're not boring. You're, you're one of the more exciting players. You can't shoot, but you dominate the game physically. No one's seen someone like you, arguably, since LeBron, really, with the way you go coast to coast, you dunk, you dominate a game like that. But you can tell he's kind of getting frustrated with the, you know, the, the lack of respect or whatever, whether it's the MVP race or these other guys getting more shine than them. I feel like this is kind of his way of kind of getting it out there. But... Last night was crazy. 50 points in 30 minutes is, is hard to do. I don't care how depleted, you know, the Pelicans are, who you're playing. That's impressive. And to go 20 of 26 from the field, he gets he gets to his spots. He rarely takes bad shots. He sometimes will settle for some jumpers, which obviously isn't his strength. But he's right there in the MVP race for me. But it, it's it's he's just he's all about business. He goes about it. He dominates. And more games like this, and we're going to be talking about him a lot more. You know, Eddie, th- that 50 actually came with a, a three late in the game. Some say that could be defined as stat padding. What would you say? Uh, some is me. I, I, I'll be the guy <laughs> to say it. He absolutely stat padded. I mean, the, the commentator crew knew he was. He looked at the scoreboard and knew he had 47. He shot two threes in 20 seconds of each other, up 19 and then up 22 in that game against a team missing their three best players against a team that the energy of their game was just off. He went and got the ball for this final three. (laughs) And I don't blame him. If 50's on the board, go get your 50. I don't blame him at all. It was great. At the end of the day, he took advantage of of an opportune matchup, a a depleted team, and did exactly what he should do. He should score 40 to 50 points against this team, and he did it. And Look, those threes are probably the two biggest, the two most difficult shots of the night for him, and he <laughs> drained them both. 30 foot three from Giannis, not expecting that. I tip my hat to the 50, but let's call it what it was. He definitely stat batted that last couple of minutes, but that's fine. I'm pro stat pad. Don't take me out the game when I have 59. I don't care for a 40. Let me in there and get my numbers. If I'm a rebound away from a triple double, let me Ricky Davis it. I, I'm pro stat pad. So good job on Giannis. Right? I, why wouldn't everybody be pro stat pad? What is the point otherwise, Jalen? I mean, I seriously, I don't get why we, we say it way, negatively. Tatum did this a couple weeks ago, and he said, exactly. Jamal Crawford texts him, no one remembers 46, 47, 48. So it does 50. That's a headline. That packs a punch. We're opening. We're, we're probably going to open the show anyways if you had 47 or not with this game. But 50, <laughs> yeah. 50 packs a bigger punch. Uh, yeah, 50 Chandler's just has never a nice stat padded in his life, you know? No. God, no, he's an honorable man, Chandler Parsons. That's what everybody says. Uh, Shams, I am am so excited to finally get to you on this topic because you have some news concerning the Bucs, right? Yeah, I mean, we're on the cusp of of the Super Bowl, and I think we're finally at the 10-yard line of the Jay Crowder saga. I'm told the Suns have given permission to the Bucs to meet one-on-one with Jay Crowder ahead of the trade deadline. I'm told this meeting took place over the weekend between Jay Crowder 
and the Bucks, and, and they've been seriously engaged in conversations. Uh, sources tell me that the Bucks' recent offer, most current offer, offer is Jordan Awara, Serge Ibaka, George Hill, uh, second round draft compensations for Crowder. So we'll see between now and the trade deadline on February 9th, next Thursday. Can they? Can these two sides get a deal done one on one? Do they need to find a third team? That's really been the issue, the hold up this whole time. Is the the Suns have wanted a three four back in the in in return for any trade? They have not been able to find it. They've tried to get Jalen McDaniels, KJ Martin, on and on. They just have not been able to get that package with the, whatever the Bucks have to offer. The Heat and Hawks they remain in play, but the fact mm. that the Bucks are the only team that have gone this far. You know, it gives some credence that I think Milwaukee is in pole position to get him. Good Lord. This is the longest ordeal. By the way, what does a meeting like that even consist of? Like, you haven't played in a long time. Do they, Chandler, do you think they talk about, like, how have you stayed in shape? And what are they, what's the discussion to have? Yeah, for sure. And I wouldn't even be surprised if he's doing private workouts for them or, you know, the video or something, because this is a guy that hasn't played all year long who's, I don't know if he's a flip the switch on kind of guy and go right into the season this late and just kind of be that impact player. But listen, I think this is great for the Bucks. They're giving up. You know, they're offering guys that don't really have a real role. Ibaka wants out anyways. These other two guys aren't really assets for the future or this season. And Jay Crowder is that championship caliber resume guy that can come in and does all the little things. He's the P.J. Tuckers of the world. They, every team needs guys like this that could knock down shots, that can switch pick and roll, that can guard one through five, and that can really relieve pressure defensively on the wing for guys like Chris Middleton that's coming back and Giannis that's going to carry a huge load offensively in the playoffs. Jay Crowd, this is a perfect fit for a team that's most definitely a contender that's missing a guy like a Jay Crowder that would kind of you know, we'll see if he's in shape. We'll see if it's, you know, I think the sooner the better for Jay Crowder to get more reps, to kind of get their all-star weekend, to get familiar with the guys in the system. But yeah, this is a perfect situation, I think, for him if he's still in shape and ready to rock. Yeah, I think it's a great it? move for them. Yeah, I think it's a great move for them. And even if you're not the biggest Jay Crowder fan, you're talking about moving three players that they're not going to play either way, including Sergey Baca, who they've already decided they're going to move on from and, and mutually. So they add to their wing depth, which they need desperately, obviously with Chris Middleton working his way back. And I think it opens up their lineup versatility. Now you have four plus uh, perimeter defenders with Jay Crowder, Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, and whomever the, other, the fourth you want to play is, whether it's uh, Grayson Allen or uh, I forget his name. But yeah, so you get this lineup that you can play and you don't have to use your bigs. You don't have to use Bobby Portis, who's out hurt right now. You don't have to use... Brooke Lopez, who sometimes isn't right for the perfect matchup, it changes their versatility. And if Jay Crowder can get in the shape in time for the playoffs, they'll be great. Um, I like it for them. And, and it's just adding another piece. It's just opening up a little bit more versatility for them to play either big or small and match up against whoever else in the East they need to match up with. And just finally, we get to see there's such a curiosity that's been built around this. On the other side of things, though, that was the Pelicans' eighth straight loss. Uh, they're now tied for eighth in the West. Chandler, I, this was a team that started out so strongly, and we thought, oh, man, they've got a real shot at this. What's going on? What is wrong? I mean, they're obviously banged up. And this is a team, when they're fully loaded and they're healthy, they're, they're my league pass team. They are so fun to watch. They're young, they're explosive, <laughs> they're athletic. Like, I really enjoy watching the, the Pelicans play. This team they're throwing out there the last eight games, that's, that's not the Pelicans. When you have Zion playing to only 29 games, Brandon Ingram, who I think is their best player still, and their best go-to score, playing 17 games, that, that's a recipe for disaster. And these guys, these young guys that are getting thrown in the fire, they're getting good experience. And the Western Conference is so jumbled up there where – they're going to get in the they're going to get in the playoffs, and if they're healthy, that's a team that I do not want to play, uh, and they can definitely make some noise. But this is just a team that's going through it, and nothing seems to be going their way. But once they get their guys back, I expect them to kind of go on a run here in the, in the second half of the season because, you know, they're too talented, they're too excited, and it's just all about health with them. Zion's an all-star starter. Like, we, we know what he's capable of, but by the time he'll be out, even his next reevaluation period in a, about a week and a half, he's going to have missed two, uh, basically one month of the season. And so this, is, this was a pretty serious hamstring strain that he had. Uh, so to miss one month, going into all-star break, you know, we talk about players 
and, and if they're going to be available for the All-Star break. We've seen the approach that the Pelicans have taken with Zion Williamson and, and how they've brought him along because it's not only making sure that he recovers from the injury itself, but also conditioning, basketball shape, making sure his, his conditioning is, is on point, um, everything that goes with being Zion Williamson, how, how unique his physique is at 6'6", six, six, uh, being, being able to jump the way he's able to jump. Uh, without him in the lineup, th th it's a big blow as much as they've tried to uh, n negate the, the pressures on Zion Williamson throughout his career. He's a big focal point of this team. If he's not in the lineup, this team is not a contending team, period. And I think they're just trying to make sure that he's going to get back in the lineup. I would be very surprised if, if, if they would just clear him for All-Star Weekend. I think this is going to be a process where we'll see if, if he's going to even be able to go then. Yeah, it's frustrating. This was a team that was the one seed, it feels like, a week ago. And dealing with these injuries, you lose your top three guys for the time you lose them for. Th there's almost no recovering from that. Now, Brandon Ingram is back, and, and you know, you're slowly working him back up to full speed. Uh, I, I, you know, we'll see CJ McCollum at some point soon, but would not shock me if we don't see Zion until after the All-Star game. And it's probably the right move. I mean, they need to get him right, and they need to have him ready for the playoffs. And, and you can sneak an extra week, week and a half by sitting him out the All-Star game. You got to do it. Uh, makes it real interesting out there in the West as well for the starting lineup for that All-Star team. I think, you know, Demonis Sabonis is deserving. I think Lori Markin is deserving. Um, the, the, the coaches uh, in the league have uh, their hands full figuring out who gets that spot if Zion does sit. I just hope the hole doesn't get too deep for them when they do finally get it all back together. Um, Memphis. Memphis for a while there. That Shannon Sharp curse was real, y'all. But it has finally been lifted because they beat the Pacers 112-100. Jaw with 27-10 and 15. They've been on a weird, a bit of a weird funk, um, but they're still sitting second in the West, so no big deal there. Chandler, how much confidence do you have in this team going forward? Uh, yeah, this this team is fun, and a, a lot with these other teams, it, it's these guys being healthy. It's Jaron Jackson being able to play a full season and being, you know, full speed come playoff time. It's Desmond Bain getting back in the lineup and kind of being that shot maker for this team. But a team like this, they added some solid role players, but I do think they're better. They're a year older. They've created this identity of, of arrogance and toughness and trash talking, which, you know, you can either love it or hate it, but this is them. You know, this like this is Dylan Brooks through and throughout. He, he's going to bark. He's going to talk. Uh, he's going to irritate. <laughs> um, and and this, is, this is who they are. And when you look, I've never seen the Western Conference standings like this. Like, you, I've never seen a team a half game out of the play-in, but a game or two in home court advantage. So I, I think it. this team is young. They're exciting. They're fun. And again, there's four or five teams that at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if they came out of the Western Conference, but they do need to pick it up. They've been, they've been going through a, a tough stretch here. The, the Shannon Sharp curse is, is real. <laughs> uh, but it was good to see them get back on on the winning side here, and and John's got John's got to continue to have games like this and dominate, especially when Desmond Bain, who's their second best player, is out. They need Ja to do this, and they need Dylan Brooks to somehow find a way to kind of be more efficient. He can't be going two for 11. He can't be having these games where he's four for 16. Um, he's too good of a player. He's too smart of a player to to be having such inefficient games like this, and, and they're going to need him on both sides of the ball. Yeah, look, it's it's good for them to get a, to t to play a team in the Eastern Conference. <laughs> they're seven and eight in the West since John Morant declared that they're fine out West, uh, which is just <laughs> odd and peculiar and funny. But I mean, the Western Conference is tight, like Chandler said. Look, they're fine. We haven't seen them fully healthy pretty much all season long. Uh, and, and in the small stretch that we did, they were incredible. They were the one seed, and they look like one of the best teams in the league. Uh, they're battle tested. They'll be ready. John ja Morant looks great. He killed my parlay yesterday by hitting the over on his rebounds. Yo. But like Chandler mentioned, Dylan Brooks hit the under on everything. He has. They have to figure out that position and, and, and their starting lineup and their closing lineup because yo, I know that they love him for their culture and what he does on defense. A little bit of a hack, but when you get away with it, you're not a hack. You're a defender. Uh, I'm. I'd be shocked if they're not all in on some of those guys that look like they might be available at the deadline. Like. Shams reported today, Dorian Finney-Smith or even an OG Ananobi, or they want to shoot as high as Pascal Siakam. They have all their draft picks. They have a slew of young guys, and, and they have some nice contracts they can trade out. They can make one more move and really look like the best team in the league going into the, into the playoffs and be a true Ooh. championship favorite. And I think they should take their shot. I think it's time to you know, strike while the iron's hot and uh, make a run while they can. Yeah, they, they went 0-5 on that road trip, lost Steven Adams for, th for three to five weeks. And even in the first half, they were down 19 points. 
uh, just so, so, something about their edge, their swagger just seemed a little low. I'm curious from Chandler's perspective, like when you are dominating last year, they dominated the Western Conference. This year they started off so hot. Like, does that wear on you? You're getting other teams' best chances every, every night. You're getting everyone's best swing. It's clearly the last week, and, week, week and a half has, has worn on them to a, to a degree. But I'm curious from a player perspective, how much does it wear on you to, to really trying to be dominant every night? And then you have moments like this where you're not. Oh, no doubt. Like teams like this, teams like Dallas, when you have such good years like last year's, you you are, you've created this bullseye on your back and there truly are no nights off. And especially with the Grizzlies, I mean, this is a team that has embraced this culture. They are the new bad boys of the NBA. They've kind of selfishly and, and individually created this rivalry with the Warriors by all this trash talking and stuff like this. This is this is what they do. and This is who they are. So you best believe when you're making comments like that and that you're good in the West and that, you know, they're a dynasty and all these other comments they've made, that's going to piss people off. It's going to piss players off and they're going to want to beat you and they're going to want to have their A game against you and they're going to want to talk trash right back. And and so it's I, I get it and I think they're capable of of having it under control and, and winning a lot of these games. But yeah, for sure, when, when you when you don't throw stones if you live in a glass house and I feel like kind of they're getting the, the best punch from everybody now. God, I love it. So by the way, I, as a fan seeing the standings like that, because for so long it was people by now had already sort of gotten away from the pack. I love it. I love the fact that we have no idea he's going to be in the finals this year, but there was a God. I love a conspiracy theory. Y'all look at that. That's a beautiful little piece of art right there. There's not, it's not clear cut yet. It's still changing a lot. <laughs> uh, the internet was nuts all about Jaron Jackson Jr. Something about cooking the books at home and there was like some stat padding or something like that, if you will, but I don't want to call it that because it wasn't. But Reddit, as usual, never disappoints. <laughs> Eddie, I'm sure you got into this. What did you think about the whole thing? Well, shout out to uh, Kevin O'Connor at The Ringer who did the due diligence of watching all of these videos and deciding that no, there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't some literal stat padding here. But look, there's been home cooking the books forever. I remember this happening with Russell Westbrook, his triple double season, and just getting the benefit of the doubt with a lot of rebounds. I remember this happening to Anthony Davis with blocks, even going so far back as Chris Paul with steals and some turnovers. It, it, it's been going on for as long as the league has been around. It, that's part of having the home court. Uh, you know, his his numbers being that far apart the splits is interesting but yo yeah. maybe he's a little more charged up in front of a uh, yo Gotti and them out there in memphis i don't know but uh I, the, my thing my takeaway from this is his defensive player of the year candidacy isn't built on his blocks or the steals it's, it's really his effect on the defense as a whole and he's in, he's been incredible now i still have nick claxton ahead of my race but i'm biased and i'm <laughs> getting uh kind of lonely on that island there but that's fine uh uh, Jaron has been great, and, and whether he got an extra block or steal at home this season, it, it really doesn't matter. You, you can see his effect on the defense without looking at the box score. Yeah, I will say he beat this, the case. this happened. Yeah. <laughs> he did this, quickly. This usually happens when it's someone's a rebounder or two away from like a triple double or a double double. And you'll see, you know, I'll throw the ball ahead and somebody will take two or three dribbles, do a move and score. And you'll see you got an assist. That guy got an assist for that. So like that, that will only happen at home because the away scorekeepers and whoever's working the clock, they don't care about your, you know, your defensive player of the year chase or, or whatever your, your triple <laughs> double. So I've seen it. Obviously people aren't adding points, but you can, you can definitely, you could throw Jaron Jackson in a block if, if it's really a steal and you know he's trying to lead the league in blocks you can definitely pat stats in kind of sneakier ways but I, I don't think there's anything here in, in Memphis in particular that's just kind of stuff in his stats but I've definitely <laughs> seen it on like an assist given the benefit of the doubt or you know if I tip the rebound they've been giving the tips to that person all game long but then all of a sudden I get it off a tip but that's my rebound things like that will happen but I, I don't think there's anything here. counts Accounts. By the way, five blocks last night at home. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, take a deep <laughs> breath. We've put it off long enough. Whew, time to go back to Saturday night and Lakers, Celtics. Ah, the Celtics beating the Lakers, but it's the controversial no call heard around the world. The LeBron layup forcing OT. Refs admitting afterwards that they did miss the call with what was almost a sarcastic uh, post, in, in my opinion. Darvin Ham calling the best player on earth can't get a call. Uh, it was it was nuts, right? There was so much going on in the end of this game, Chandler. All right. <clears throat> Is LeBron 
not getting calls that other players are getting? This is tough, and I don't, even, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin on on this. This this was an awesome <laughs> game. This was a crazy game, and you never want to see a game end like this where it's such an obvious foul that was just missed. And I will say this: NBA referees they have the worst job in the For world. For sure. Every time they blow that whistle, there's a half the court is pissed at you and thinks you're wrong. And then half the court's, you know, twirling the finger for the review. This was a case where there was a ref right there, kind of in the replay, looking right at LeBron here, this guy, the white guy in the corner here. I mean, this is an obvious foul. I will say that this reaction, it was a lot. But I think this is kind of a (laughs) combination. This is a a combination of them being frustrated, how their season's gone. And when you're in a situation like them where you're two games back of of the play in, you need every win. And I know, like last night, the Bengals didn't lose this game because of that 15 yard penalty at the end of the game. There's never one play. You can look back and see a bunch of missed foul calls. That happens to everybody. Do I think teams are being targeted or LeBron's not getting his respect? No. I think the ref just honest made an honest mistake and he messed up. It just happened to be magnified because it's the Lakers and the Celtics on national TV. But it's a tough job. I don't know why they do it. It's a horrible job. They're always going to be wrong for half the court and right for half the court. This was this was just tough because the Lakers and everything they're going through this season, with the blow of that whistle, they win this game. LeBron just makes one of those free throws. So I see the frustration. I see how angry they are. But this happens every single night. This happens in multiple games. This probably happened in a lesser, you know, Houston versus Orlando game than the same night. And we're not even talking about it because it's not the Lakers and Celtics. So it does happen every game. It's just sometimes you're on the, the better end of the whistle and sometimes you're not. Oh, I've got a magic tweet. It. Oh, I love magic tweets. Oh, so matter of fact. I'm going to just say it. I'm just saying it, Michelle. I'm sorry. I, I love the Lakers. Like, they just <laughs> entertain me so thoroughly every but single night. But not for night. the right reason. Whether it's... <laughs> Whether they're winning, whether they're losing, it doesn't matter. They're just entertainment every day. Either Anthony Davis has a great outfit on or he's playing a great game. Either LeBron is throwing a complete absolute tantrum or uh, Patrick Beverly is bringing a camera to the referee Uh, and losing a point that acts absolutely cost the Lakers in that game. They needed that point desperately at the end of overtime. And they just entertain me through and through. Yes, look, look, I got... I got flamed for calling LeBron dramatic. He was on his hands and knees screaming about this foul. Like, what else am I supposed to call that? That was insane. He he absolutely got hacked. Like, do not get me wrong. That was one of those hacks. Like, it probably made a noise. Like, the ref heard the hack and didn't call it. It was it was absolutely absurd. But look, they had five minutes to win that game. They had five. They had a five-minute game after that, and they could not keep up. And they got spotted the other team a point. So yes. Like Chandler said, they didn't lose the game on that call. That call hurts, but they had five minutes to get it together and win that game. Would have been a big win. Couldn't take care of business. It sucks. I I, I saw the LeBron tweet. I saw, like, the four different instances of that happening over the last (laughs) month. I I get it. They've had some bad calls. Uh, You know, is LeBron getting the type of calls that other guys get? LeBron's kind of in that Joel Embiid zone where he flops a ton and he gets hit a ton, and there's just really no right answer for him. And Hold on. It sucks, but it's, you know – he, he, that reaction was my favorite part of the whole game. I mean, no at one point, he's like the Good thinker. Job, like, he's so, it's so over the top. And by the way, I don't know what you're talking about, LeBron flopping. He told us just this season that he was going to learn how to flop. So I don't know what you're talking about or accusing him of. Shams, I mean, I, like, what, everybody's what reaction was, to what everything. Was, what was better? What was better, what? the thinker or like the end of the game, sitting out the final play with the towel <laughs> over his head and just like pouting? I will too say, much. I, I will they were say both it. great. I could watch my French bulldog get ran over by the mailman right now, and I would not react like that. I swear. By the way, <laughs> that was one of the crazy. How dare you? But oh my God, what's wrong with you? It is way more. It's so impressive that he cares that much on a regular season game that he's doing that. Does he? Does he care Does, that much, or is this just part of the drama that is LeBron James? That's a lot. That is a lot. That is embarrassing. Yeah, Gator. I, 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 I personally, I mean, by the I way, I personally think if, that you gotta be. It's tough to script that, though. It's very tough to script that. Like in the well, moment, well, they could have scripted the heat, it in I Space think, Jam too. <laughs> Would have been better. I just, I just think that's. A, listen, I love the passion. I, I was texting Eddie after, like, I love the passion. Very, very dramatic. I, I, I personally love the passion. 
Um, but I, I think, you know, brutal loss, like Chandler said, missed calls happen at the end of the games. It's, it's crazy that this is like the missed call heard around the world, and that probably <laughs> is because it's LeBron James. It's very <laughs> rare that we, we have seen LeBron James just miss calls, like, like missed calls on him, right? Because I think the, 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 the yeah. topic early on in his career, midway through his career, was like, yo, he didn't drive. Like, he would have gotten the call or he would have made the layup. You know, he shied away from the moment. You know, LeBron went right to the basket. He didn't sell for a jumper. He went right to the basket, got hit on the arm. The ref was right there, and still he didn't get a call. Um, so I, I definitely understand from a Lakers perspective how frustrating that is. You know, from the Celtics standpoint, what I saw is that Jason Tatum struggled down the stretch, and Jalen Brown, which we saw during the finals, like he stepped up as, yeah. as their closer. He had 11 points in OT. I think he's showing me a lot in the last year and a half that, like, when push comes to shove, when they need buckets down the stretch of games, like Jalen Brown is as reliable as anyone on that team. And I think that just helps them out even more on nights when Jason Tatum uh, might struggle down the stretch. I, my favorite thing, though, is after the game, Tatum being asked about everything that was going on. And he's just like, man, it, there was just so much. I have no idea. And I loved it so much. Because <laughs> what else are you going to say to that? But by the way, the Pat Beverly thing was also just some ridiculousness on top of what was already over the top, bringing the camera out, showing the ref, automatically getting t up. <laughs> Do we expect Shams any further consequences for the use of props here? I mean, I, I, I think there's precedence that, listen, if you come up to a rep, whether you say something derogatory, whether you, you touch them, whatever, I think this probably falls in the line of, of showing up the rep in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I do think that that's very, very possible. I think that's something that the NBA is discussing now. We'll see today if there's a ruling. Uh, but listen, I thought this was funnier more than anything. I, I, I know on the telecast they were saying like it was totally wrong and I don't think it was sure. a, a heinous crime committed. I thought it was just laughable and funny. I don't think we've ever seen that before. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this was wrong at all. I think this was pure comedy. This is one of the funnier things I've ever seen on the basketball court. And he made some huge plays at the end of that game. And this is funny that he had this tip dunk, he knocked down a three, and this, and this so is quick. his highlight. But wow. Between this and the Dame, the broken watch, <laughs> Pat, Pat is straight comedy this year, and he's bringing the heat. But he really did make some big plays down the stretch there and put them in position to win that game. But this is just such a mood point to me. Like, there was probably a play in this game where LeBron got away with Oh, my God. Players. You know what I mean? It's like, this is... <laughs> this is just a tough and yeah, Pat Bev, I think just he wins MVP of this game. He's quick. He that is was quick. the most unexpected play of all time. Yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> but man, like, I love happening? the ref's reaction. He's just the ref like puts two and two together finally and is like, wait, yep. what? Tag, when they get grind. out of here. Like, what are you doing? It, you can that see his face go Lakers. from I love the ref's face. I'm with you, Eddie. The ref's face going from why do you have a camera to realizing why he has the camera to grabbing his whistle and blowing. It's it's just such a good few seconds of comedy. But and you know it's all happening in L.A. for that crap. Like it, you couldn't have scripted it better for ridiculousness. But thank you. More, more thank national you. TV for the Lakers, please. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm all in. All the actors are watching. Okay, we'll move on to some uh, some MVP talk and right. Oh no. We're going to go to break. We got to talk a little Miles Turner when we come back. Sorry, we spent so much time on the Lakers, and how could we not? All of that when Run It Back returns. Well, well, we've got some news over the weekend. People getting paid, Shams. What do you have for us? So Miles Turner and the Pacers, they've agreed to a renegotiation and extension. He gets a newfound money, two years, $58 million. <laughs> it's really a win-win for both sides. He's getting... 17 million this season because the Pacers had salary space on top of his 18 million. So that's 35 million this year. And then he gets 20.9 next season and then 19.9 in 2024, 20, 25. Uh, so he gets some money up front. The Pacers have him under contract through 2025. And I think there's a lot of security for both sides. He's not going to be on the trade market this season from everything I'm told. So don't expect Miles Turner to go anywhere. But this summer, depending on how the Pacers are feeling, how he's feeling, um, he could very well end up being back on the trade market. To me, that contract that he just signed after the season will be arguably the best value contract in the NBA. Only $20.9 million on the books for next year, nineteen point nine the year after that. So a very tradable deal that's going to have a lot of interest around the league. He got money. That's all. There's nothing else to say. We don't need to talk about it. It's just congratulations to you. Send loans. Uh, Shams, we will see you manana. Have a good rest of your day, but you guys don't go anywhere because it's time.
time. That man has a family and a star-studded episode we have for you today. Uh, we will start with a little Jared Allen. Jared Allen, he's he's First so long. Long. He feels like he barely even jumps when he dunks. I know. It doesn't look like big he's man. jumping at all. Beep. Big man on big man crime. First man all first time all-star last year. That's that's tough. I mean, Moses had nothing for him. He didn't even try to jump. It's just shouldn't let him get that far, <laughs> big fella. <laughs> What's the point? Why jump? You're just gonna make a fool of yourself. How about Giannis? Over the entire Pacers oh. tape. Literally <laughs> overall. <laughs> It's funny that all three That's, of them were there and all of them maybe could have fouled, maybe could have tried to block it, could have tried right? to take a charge, and all three of them were on the same wave. Get the hell out of the way. <laughs> it's like not not one hand, nothing. No, nobody tried. Yeah. Huh. That's how you stat pad. That's, been a, That's how you stat been, pad like a pro. There. Oh, you're, gonna, you're saying that stat padding when the, the other team's in on it? <laughs> <laughs> the That's ultimate tough, controversy. Like to... to he, I mean, he was almost falling and still found a way to dunk that ball damn near backwards. That's that's insane. That's yeah, I know. I get I get nervous when they fall though. I don't want I don't want any bad injuries, especially to the, to the stars as we get closer and closer to things happening. Uh, Nas Reed, let's see. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. Hey, this kid <laughs> Please put has him back on the trade block. Yeah, this kid has been balling. He does it all. Look at it, in and out. For, ah, that is nasty. Chandler, can I ask you a yeah, question I'm always wondering? Why do some oh. guys choose to wear shirts? You know what? Usually it comes <laughs> like an injury, Michelle. Like it comes with some sort of like a shoulder injury, and then he probably played good in a game or two, and now it's just ah. kind of like a delicious thing. I've always wondered, because we have Stanley Johnson here, and he always wears shirts, and I, you know, I don't know how to ask that. <laughs> you have to have a medical, I think, reason in the beginning, but then I think you just run with huh. that if you're good. Okay. See, Eddie, yeah. I asked the hard-hitting questions. Do you do that on etc.? Informative. Yeah, I didn't think of so. Of course. <laughs> Isaiah Livers. Oh. Don't know who you are, but this is a body. <laughs> yeah, you told me star-studded, Michelle. What, what am I looking at right here? What is? You're looking over at Isaiah Shit. Livers over Bruno Fernando. Show some respect. Shout, shout out to Put them. Put him in the dunk shout contest. Them. Put him in the moment. dunk contest. <laughs> Why not? Why <laughs> not? <laughs> Oh, you know what? Hey, that man, guy that, just had a moment. I'm not taking away from that. I, re I respect the energy from both in a clear tank game. Like, I, I respect yeah. that. that. That's this is an exhibition <laughs> and they're playing hard. I love that it. That is a clear tank game that you're right. You're right. This next one is not it's not about who it's about who on oh. Eddie. Eddie, you're up. Oh, my. <laughs> you are up, bud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, it's to be expected, right? Let's give some respect to my guy, Matu and the Kings. Light the beam up <laughs> over there. Yeah, Rudy can't get that deep though. Like, what are you, what are you doing, buddy? That's your the defense player oh. here. Nobody understands. What a disaster this whole like thing is. There's like a little hint of shame afterwards. Watch him cover yeah. his face. Like, ah, like you know, this is. You're right. Like here it goes. Oh. Ah. Like he's hiding from the cameras, <laughs> but you can't. He didn't want. Yeah. He, didn't, he, he did, did not want the ball to hit him in the face afterwards. <laughs> I mean, it's a good face. Look, whatever Eddie thinks about, it, it's a good face, and you don't want to ruin that. Gotta that's all I got. Frenchman. That's all I got for you guys. <laughs> oh, we're going to take a quick break. Um, when we come back, did Embiid maybe finally catch Jokic in this big old MVP race? We will discuss all of that next when Run It Back returns. Run it up, run it back, yeah. Run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up. Shot clock at seven. Irving gets it back. Step back three. Brooklyn in the house. I mean, does he know that he can take a couple steps forward on that one? You don't need to do it from there. That was, uh, of course, Kyrie in a dagger. He had 21 of his 32 points in the fourth quarter in that win over the Knicks. Um, I, I you know what? I kind of want to start with Eddie because I want to see if you're still learning things. What did you learn about Kyrie on Saturday, if anything? I didn't learn anything. I, I, he, he confirmed <laughs> my biases. If anything, I, I told him uh, a, like a month ago. You know, I think he's. I think he's gonna win that Jerry West Clutch Award, the inaugural award. And he just kind of nodded and smiled and said, "It's only right." Uh, he's the only player in the league that scored 20 points in the fourth quarter four times this season. He leads the league in fourth quarter scoring. He's ridiculous, and it, it, it's it's kind of crazy how he can have a bad game and just turn it on like that in the fourth yeah. quarter. I think he shot 9 of 27 that game, and he was obviously very slow going in, and then he just opened up, and it went from there. 21 points in the fourth quarter of a close game is insane. 
And uh, let's stop calling Knicks Nets a rivalry because they have not mm-hmm. won in quite some time against against That's uh, Big Brother over there across the bridge in Brooklyn. In fairness, though, we still refer to Lakers Clippers as a rivalry, and it's the same sort of lopsidedness. Chandler, did you learn anything about Kyrie? I mean, this is what he does, and, and this is kind of his time to shine, and he, he's he's doing it. With KD out, he's taking over. He's making huge plays. He scores. He's probably my favorite player to watch. Just the way oh. he does it is, is unbelievable. Uh, his the, the way he can handle the ball, the way he shoots the ball, the way he finishes at the rim, uh, he really is a special talent. And with all the stuff that he's dealt with this season, to be playing the way he's playing, uh, it really is impressive. And, and I think he's grown from that. I think he's matured from that. Um, and he is a huge, huge piece of this team, obviously, and the success that they're having. And that's a tall task. Kevin Durant goes out and the onus falls on you. And, you know, a lot of the other guys in your, that roster have been inconsistent all year long. Uh, to come up big like this, to have 21 points in the fourth quarter again uh, is super impressive. And, and But I'm not surprised. This is what he's been doing his whole career, and he's an absolute star. So I know... Eddie mentioned that it's not really a rivalry because they've won nine straight against the Knicks. Even in the West Coast, I want to say Clippers are nine and ten or or ten and zero over the Lakers. However, there's still people want to call it a rivalry, and people still refer to New York as a Knicks town, Chandler. So, what do we do if we don't call it a rivalry? And will that ever change? Will it ever be a Nets town? Uh, I don't know if it'll ever be a Nets town. I don't know if LA will ever be a Clippers town. Uh, but listen, it's, it's still a rivalry because they're going to the same restaurants. They're going to the same bars <laughs> and clubs. Like it's, 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 it's not like there's animosity and it's not like it's very one sided. The Nets have dominated this and the Clippers have dominated that one, but you still got to see these guys. You still, you still have the same circle, same friends, same girls you're talking to. It's still some sort of rivalry because <laughs> you have the same occupation, the same job. And you see these guys outside of playing them one night, you know, in, a diff- in another city. So it's fun. It's exciting. I wish it was a little bit more competitive on, on both fronts in LA and New York, but same. it's obviously, it's still going to be, it's, it's going to be a rival, you know, for a pretty long time. Yeah, it's fun. And, it, it's fun, and I would love for them to play a playoff series. Like, I, I think the city could use that. It, it, it would it'd mm-hmm. be great. Look, it's always going to be a Knicks town. They play at the Mecca. They, you know, the orange and blue is synonymous with the city. And, you know, a lot of people still view the Nets as a Jersey team, and it, it is what it is. But That's the fair. Nets have their own thing going out there in Brooklyn, and they have their own energy. And, and look, they keep beating them. <laughs> just, you know, you want to you dominate a rivalry, you win on the court. And, and you know, I, I know last year their local TV viewership kind of crept closer and closer, and it is what it is. Manhattan will always be a Knicks town, and, and that's them. And the Nets are building something in Brooklyn. They're building their culture. They've been there 10 years now. Give them another 10, and, and you know, maybe, maybe they can compete with that in a sense. But they have some of the biggest stars in the league right now on that team, and it's still a Knicks team. There's a lot of loud Knicks fans in there that night for about – 47 minutes or so and then it got pretty quiet but uh yeah i mean i i'd love to see a series and i hope we get to see it i would love to see a breakdown of all the same girls that they're talking to and if eddie you could get on that for me since you are east coast correspondent i would appreciate that very much thank you uh look tonight they're playing the nets lakers are lebron and ad not gonna play um here we go we're gonna start questioning it chandler or eddie actually i'll ask you do you question resting these guys so that they could play the knicks tomorrow night um, a little bit because of the reaction from the other night and then the fact that LeBron is still posting about it. And, and uh, I, I get that they have the rest. I mean, maybe stagger them. Maybe try to win this game. I mean, maybe you're just tipping your hat to the Nets and saying the Nets are too much. I, I don't know. I, I I think these guys just want to enjoy uh, Carbone and uh, Little Sister and Zero Bond and just see the city. That's just my thoughts. But, hey, I'm all for it. Enjoy it. We'll, we'll take – the uh, LeBron and AD less Lakers in Park Place tonight. That's fine. Yeah, usually when this happens, this just shows that they think they have a better chance to beat the Knicks than the Nets, which is pretty obvious. But um, maybe it's giving them more time after you know such a such a stressful game against Boston. <laughs> uh, who knows what it is? But I mean, I think it's the Lakers where they are. They need to win games. They need to win as many right. games. as Possible, but they also do need to be healthy going down the stretch. And there's still a lot of basketball to be played. Um, but in a situation like this, I know teams, they, they, they sit you on a more realistic loss versus a team that you think you have a better chance of winning.
Well, conspiracy theorists would say they're sitting LeBron because he's, what, 117 away from the record, and then they go home. So I'm just saying, looks like maybe that's what they're trying to do, which, P.S., wrong priorities. Wrong priorities. That's all I have on that. Uh, this game was a Saturday night game. I think it was the first on the docket, um, at least the big one. Nuggets, Sixers. Oh, my goodness. Joel Embiid with 47 and 18. It was a win over Denver. Jokic ended up with 24, 8, and 9. This will be, I hope, a topic moving forward. Did did Embiid finally catch Jokic, Chandler? Is it possible that we can switch the narrative to now just these two? Uh, it, it seems like it's a different guy every week, and now <laughs> you see kind of Luca and Tatum taking a step back, and it's these two guys, and it's fun, and it's rare to see two centers battling it out and being the two most dominating players in the league. And to me, this was a statement game for Joel Embiid. He knew this was national TV. He knew everyone's talking about Jokic three in a row. Oh, he's the clear cut favorite. And Embiid has just been carrying that Philly team with Tyrese Maxey out a lot of the time. And he was on a mission to start the game. He went straight at him. Uh, anytime he got a chance to do an ISO, he was kind of going right at him, right at Jokic. And if there's a flaw in Jokic's game, it's, it's defense and and joel really went at him and just any way he could pulling up jumpers posting him up driving by him with nasty dunks uh you shouldn't be able to do that at, at, at that size so he just kind of put on an, a, a, an absolute show a performance and, and joel's hilarious he's gonna troll he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna make jokes he is a big huge personality and games like this on national tv it's tough to now look away from him and uh, it's looking like a two man race for now, but who knows? Like I said, there's a lot of basketball to be played. Yep. I appreciate the pettiness. I appreciate the competitiveness. I appreciate that he went at him with the dagger. I appreciate that the Sixers continue to go at him over and over and over with pick and roll and, and just getting him involved in every action on the floor. I mean, to me, that's what separates the two players and it separates Jokic from the other top players is, a lot of those clips he's getting scored on. It's not to say that these guys don't get scored on, but, you know, they're attacking him in a way that they don't attack Joel Embiid. They don't attack Giannis Antetokounmpo. You know, so it's like you have to consider that when doing that. I do think Joel is the, should be the leader and the favorite for the MVP right now. He doubled him up in points and rebounds. Like, that's pretty absurd. That's dominance. And he started it from the opening tip on. Like Chandler said, he knew exactly what this matchup was. He knew exactly the point he wanted to prove, and he went and did it. And, and and I kind of hate the rhetoric that goes around these two players where Joel Embiid is a stats guy and Nikola Jokic is a winning player. Th they both won a ton of games in their time. I know Nikola Jokic has played in the conference finals in the bubble, but the bubble's the bubble. Other than that, they both have done the same thing. They've came up short every single year of their careers, and, and, and that's fine. They're both great players. They're both winning players. And uh, Joel Embiid continues to get the better of him when they match up. It, 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 it is what it is. I think he's the MVP favorite. I think he should be. And I love that he cares about this matchup. And I love that in today's NBA, the two leading favorites for the, for the MVP are centers. And like true yeah. nominal centers, they play back to the basket, they post guys up, they dunk on people, all of that. I, I love this, that this still exists. I, I love the idea that Joel Embiid takes everything personally. I think that's how it should be. So you combine the fact that he's got to hear all the Jokic MVP talk. You combine the fact that he's not starting in the All-Star game, Chandler. Um, first of all, how does that make you feel that he's not starting in the All-Star game? And also, I think it's almost a good thing for the Sixers. You're poking the bear at probably the best possible times. It's ridiculous the fact that we're talking about this guy being the favorite as we speak right now, and he's not starting in the All-Star game. Uh, I think they do need to change it. The All-Star game is, is, is entertainment. It's for fun. And it should be the five best players you know, that season starting and no one plays defense anyways the game is very carefree and very lax uh i'm looking at the starting lineups here and you mb has got to be in there i don't care if there's one guard put tatum at the two kd at the three say, at the four, and right. put joel at the five but Joel Embiid, as good of a year as Donovan Mitchell's had, as good of a year as Kyrie Irving's had, Joel Embiid is a top three player in the world right now. And the fact that he's not starting in the Eastern Conference All-Star team is a joke. And, and he should be in there. And again, not to take away anything from these other guys, because they're having great years, but there is no reason that that guy is not starting in the NBA. I don't care about positions. I don't care about voting. He's a top two, top three, top five, let's say, MVP. That means he should be starting in the All-Star game.
That's the problem, right, Eddie? Yeah. Like, who are you? Who would you replace on that? Yeah, I do think they have to consider what they do here. And and I think this is going to come up again with All-NBA. You know, one of these guys is not going to be first-team All-NBA, and that's unfortunate. And I I do think they have to kind of reevaluate how they do that. And I'm not sure why Tatum isn't listed as a guard either. I know he's tall. Like, but, you know, he's a wing. Maybe go front court, back court. Maybe go guard, wing, center. I I don't know. But I, I think he ended up getting losing out to Giannis winning the captain spot and getting the guaranteed spot. And mm-hmm. you know, it's unfortunate, but he'll be in the game. He'll play a lot. He'll finish the game. And, and you know, if he ends up winning the MVP, then he won't be so upset about this anymore. And I, I think he's on his way. But, yeah, I mean, look, he's more deserving than Donovan Mitchell, right? He's probably more de- he's more deserving than Kyrie Irving. He might be the best player in the world right now. And he's going to watch the tip-off of the All-Star game, which is just, you know, you, that sucks. You see- You've seen this before too. Like Siakam isn't an All Star, but he's All NBA. Like how? Like I think it's just it's just it's confusing. It's the two had the first two or three best months of the season, and especially when it comes to starting, like the NBA needs yeah. to kind of look at the big picture and realize this ain't right. Could be it could be the best yeah, thing that happens in pick, Philly. Let the yeah, fans pick well, the five best guys. You know, five I, best I agree. Players, play five minutes of the game, sub out whoever you want to sub out. I mean, didn't Jay Crowder and Chet Holmgren <laughs> they got votes? So there you go. That's that's how much that's. that's worth. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. Like Nothing to see about the parlays last week because we're starting fresh <laughs> this week. When we come back, we'll pick for tonight. <laughs> when Run It Back returns. Run it back, yeah. Run it all. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all. Run it back. Run it all. Run it back. Whoa! Get a piece of ten million dollars in bonus bets with FanDuel's Kick of Destiny. All you have to do is bet $5 on Super Bowl 57. And if Gronk, that's Gronk, by the way, kicks a field goal live during the game, you'll get a piece of $10 million in bonus bets. It doesn't matter if you're new to FanDuel or already have an account. Gronk kick, you win. It's as simple as that. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. He's got larger breasts than I do in that picture. Good for him. That's a really big win for Gronk. But guys, technically, we're going to accountability ourselves. We I lost last week for us. Okay, I just want to put that out there. That's me being honest. Uh, but yeah, there it is. Eddie with the push. Push kind of feels yucky too. Hey, though, green but. is green is good, right? Yeah, green is good. Good job, Chandler. <laughs> it's all right because today's a brand new day, a fresh start, if you will, and maybe we can we can start a new streak every time. Eddie, what do you got? I went with Josh Giddy over the five and a half assists, uh, playing the Warriors. I'm just betting against the Road Warriors. Uh, we, we know what they are, and I love Josh Giddy. So, please get the six assists, buddy. Please. So are you begging now for your parlay? <laughs> That's I a lot. A, I lost like eight hundred dollars yesterday because John Morant decided to rebound. Like I, I hate this. <laughs> it, it's the worst. Wait, while your head, buddy. Uh, Chandler, <laughs> we got. Uh, I like the Sixers minus nine and a half. The Magic, we know the, the team they are, and Philly is kind of hitting that stride right now, coming off a big game. But also, I took the Bengals plus two last night, and they lost by three. So, <laughs> so, so take this with a grain of salt. But this shouldn't be close. This should be over in the first quarter. No brainer. I love Eddie's with Giddy. I feel you like do. That's really, oh, I feel like that's really low. How do you feel about take the actual that, game of Eddie's? Um, before I tell you my pick. Oh, there it is. Okay. I took OKC plus five and a half. Do you feel good about my the actual game itself, Chandler? Because I feel like OKC lately for me has been a bit of a winner, and I'm just sort of going to ride the hot hand. Um, this could be the night that all ends, though. But what say y'all? I, I don't want to be the one to lose OKC's again. OKC is a team I feel like I always sleep on, and they always hurt me. So this is a game that I would go the opposite, which I think that means you're in good shape. Okay. Look at us just putting each other up. I, I like that about us. Guys? We've done it. We've done another show. The good news is we also have another show tomorrow where we can get even better. So until then, enjoy your Monday nights, watch some hoops, spend time with your family. We'll see you all in the morning.